أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 56 سورة النساء Now the topic is going to change slightly I number 22 وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ آبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ And do not marry those women whom your fathers married except what has already occurred إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَمَقْتًا وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Indeed, it was an immorality and hateful to Allah and was evil as a way. وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا Over here again, the believers are being prohibited from marrying particular women. Earlier we read that لَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ أَن تَرِثُ النِّسَاء It is not permissible for you to inherit the nikah with a woman. Now we learn that it's not permissible for you to marry who? Those women whom your father is married. لا تنكحو ما نكح That which he married. ما over here gives the meaning of man. The one whom. Meaning the women whom your fathers have married. So, Who is this woman? A stepmother. So a man is not allowed to marry his stepmother. مَا نَكَحَ آبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ And the word aba is the plural of ab. And aba includes one's father. It also includes one's grandfather. Paternal and maternal, however upwards. It includes the person's father and and grandfather, paternal and maternal, however upwards. So a person is not allowed to marry his stepmother or his step-grandmother. مَا نَكَحَ آبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا قَدَ سَلَفِ Except that which has already happened. Salafa is from the root letter seen lamfa. Salafa is that which is over, that which happened in the past, that which is bygone. So مَا قَدَ سَلَفِ That which has already happened. What does it mean by this? إِلَّا مَا قَدَ سَلَفْ Meaning whatever has happened in the past has happened. If a man did marry his stepmother in the past, he cannot change that situation now. For instance, if a man married a woman in the past who was his stepmother and they had children together, what is he supposed to do? Kill those children? No. إِلَّا مَا قَدَ سَلَفْ Whatever has happened in the past has passed. Meaning, you are not blameworthy for what happened in the past. Because as we learned earlier in the ayat of Tawbah, that the one who does su out of jahala, out of ignorance. And thumma yatubu min qareeb. So, if this happened in the past out of ignorance, you're not blameworthy, you're not sinful for that. However, we do know that all of such marriages which existed at the time of the revelation of this ayah, all of those marriages were annulled. They were finished. Like for instance, if a man had married his stepmother or his step-grandmother after the revelation of this ayah, that marriage with that woman was annulled. It was nullified by the law. So, إِلَّا مَا قَدَ سَلَفْ What does it mean? That whatever has happened, has happened. Now keep the marriage? Is that what the meaning is? No. No. It doesn't mean keep the marriage. It means that you're not sinful for what happened in the past. Why? Because you didn't know. So why should you not marry your stepmother, the woman whom your father married? Because إِنَّهُ indeed it, marrying your father's wife, it is كَانَ فَاحِشَةً It is an act of indecency. It is an act of indecency. It is an extreme fahisha. Because you see, the wife of your father is like a mother to you. Right? The wife of your father is like a mother to you. Even if she is a stepmother. And to establish sexual relations with her, this is like zina. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً This is like zina. It's worse than zina. It's a violation of the honor and respect of that woman. So, إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَمَقْتًا And something that is hateful. The word مَقْتًا is from the root letter is مِيمْ قَافْتًا And maqt is to have hatred, extreme detestation for someone. 
Why? Upon seeing them committing a wrong action. Upon seeing them doing something wrong. You know, sometimes you have a very good image of someone. But then you see them doing something that is very nasty. What happens? You develop this hatred for them. Why? Because you saw them doing something wrong. So maqt is extreme hatred, extreme detestation for someone. Why? Upon seeing them do something wrong. So this act of marrying a stepmother, it is maqt. Maqt from who? First of all, maqt min Allah. Meaning, this is an act that is very offensive and it is a cause of maqt, cause of earning anger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if a person does this, he deserves the anger of Allah. He deserves the hatred of Allah. Allah hates such a person. And second, it has been said that maqtan, that this is a maqt, meaning this causes hate, this causes maqt from who? From the father or from the son. For instance, if a man marries the wife of his father, his stepmother, what kind of feelings is the son going to have for his father? What kind of feelings? Are they good feelings? Not necessarily. Because see, sometimes if there is a divorce between a couple and the second husband of the woman, what kind of feelings does he have for the previous husband? Dislike That she treated you so bad He divorced you He was so harsh towards you He divorced you So he dislikes him Similarly Who dislikes the second husband? The first husband So this is going to create Maqt between who? Father and son It brings extreme hatred And anger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But at the same time It also creates maqt between Father and son and thirdly, it has been said that وَمَقْتًا This is something that is maqt, meaning this nikah is nikah maqt. This nikah is such that deserves maqt from people. You know, sometimes two people get married and others completely disapprove of that marriage. They completely disapprove of it. So this is a marriage that is worthy of disapproval, worthy of hatred. This is maqtan. وَسَاءَ سَبِيلَ And it is an evil way. Evil way of what? Evil way of fulfilling sexual desire. Evil way of having children. Now just imagine the children that are born out of this relationship. What are they going to say? That my father is also my ex-stepbrother and my mother is also my grandmother. So just imagine, this is سَاءَ سَبِيلَ This is something that is evil. This is something that is gross. Which is why it has been said that marrying the father's ex-wife, whether divorcee or widow, it is worse than zina. It is worse than zina. Why? Because you see for zina, we learn in Surah Al-Isra, ayah number 32, that لا تقرب الزنا, don't even approach zina. Why? Because إِنَّهَا كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا it is an act of fahisha and sa'asabila, an evil way of fulfilling desire, an evil way of having children. But you see over here, what else has been said besides fahisha and sa'asabila? Maqtan. What does this show? That this act is worse than zina. This act is worse than zina. You can legalize it by having a marriage contract, but first of all, that marriage contract is not valid. And secondly, it is worse than zina. So what do we learn from this ayah? The prohibition of marrying one's stepmother. And also one's own mother. Because ma nakaha aba'ukum includes your own mother. So we learn about the prohibition of marrying one's mother or the wife of one's father or the wife of one's grandfather. Maternal or paternal. And we learn that Imam Ahmad he recorded in his sunan that Al-Bara ibn Azib, he said that his uncle Abu Burda, he was sent by the Prophet ﷺ to a man who married his stepmother. A man married his stepmother while being a Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Al-Bara ibn Azib's uncle Abu Burda 
in order to execute that man and confiscate his property. Because such a person, what is he committing? Maqtan. An act that deserves maqt min Allah and also from the people. Also we learn about the prohibition of marrying one's father and grandfather for a woman. Because obviously, if for a man, marrying his mother or stepmother or step-grandmother is forbidden, similarly for a woman, marrying her father or marrying her stepfather or marrying her grandfather, all of this is forbidden. And if such a marriage contract does occur, is it going to be valid? It's not going to be valid. And if it did occur in the past out of ignorance, is it going to remain valid? No. Can you say that illa ma qad salaf? I mean, this has happened already, so don't worry about it. No, the marriage is going to be annulled. And this also shows to us that whatever has happened in the past is over. Something that was done out of ignorance is done. You cannot go change it. You cannot go alter the past, the history. So therefore, close the chapter now. Do islah and close whatever happened in the past. Because as we learn the many commands in the surah and in the Qur'an, what happens, we think about, oh, but this happened in that situation. So and so did that. I know of so and so who did that. So instead of, you know, digging out the past and talking about the past and staying stuck over there, what does Allah say? Whatever has happened in the past has happened. You're not blameworthy for that. But from now on, fix a problem. Fix your situation and don't repeat this action again. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ Prohibited to you for marriage are who? أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Your mothers. حُرِّمَتْ From the word تَحْرِيم حَرَام What does حَرَام mean? Forbidden. تَحْرِيم is to make something unlawful. So حُرِّمَتْ meaning حَرَام for you to marry عَلَيْكُمْ upon you meaning O you Muslim men are who? أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Your mothers. In this ayah and in the following ayah we will learn about those women who are forbidden for a man to marry. Meaning a man is not allowed to marry them. A man is not allowed to marry them. And remember there are some women whom a man is never allowed to marry. There are other women whom he is temporarily not allowed to marry. So in this ayah both are mentioned. The first category is of those women who are muharramat bin nasab who are forbidden why? because of nasab because of lineage meaning you are related to them through lineage so who falls in this category first? ummahat ummahat is the plural of um or it is the plural of ummaha ummahatun with the at the end ummahatun and um and ummaha or ummat or ummahat, who are they? Mothers, biological mothers. And generally, the word ummahat is used for the aqil, like human beings. And ummat is used for ghair aqil, like in animals. So, حَرِمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Who are the ummahat? Who are the ummahat? The mothers, they include first of all the biological mother. Biological mother. Secondly, Ummahat includes both paternal and maternal grandmothers, however upwards. Paternal and maternal grandmothers, however upwards. What does it mean? That your father's mother and your mother's mother, however upwards in ascendancy. And thirdly, Ummahat also includes stepmother, as we learned in the previous ayah. Who is a stepmother? Your father's wife. So, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Secondly, وَبَنَاتُكُمْ And your daughters. Banat is a plural of bint. And who is a bint? Daughter. So, who are included in the daughters? First of all, one's biological daughter. Through nikah or without nikah. What does it mean? That a daughter born through marriage, meaning through your wife, or even a bintu zina, a daughter of a man through zina. 
Meaning he had sexual relations with a woman whom he was not married to and he ended up having a daughter with her. So that daughter also is forbidden for the men. He cannot say, oh, there was no nikah between me and her mother, so therefore I can marry her. No. Biological daughter. Whether through nikah or outside of nikah. Secondly, banat includes granddaughters. Through sons as well as through daughters. So your son's daughters as well as your daughter's daughters. Again, however downwards. You understand? However downwards. Like your son's daughter and your son's son's daughter and your son's 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 daughter. However downwards. Meaning in your grandchildren. Whatever girls you have, you're not allowed to marry them. And thirdly, banat also includes stepdaughter. Who is a stepdaughter? Rabiba, which inshallah we will learn about. The wife's daughter. The wife's daughter. Then, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ Who else? وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ And your sisters. Akhawat is a plural of ukht. And who is an ukht? Sister. And the sisters, who do they include? First of all, full sisters. What does it mean by that? That you share the same mother and father. You share the same mother and father. Secondly, akhawat includes half-sisters. What does it mean by that? Half-sister. That you share only the father and not the mother. Or you share only the mother and not the father. Alright? You understand? Everybody? Who is a half-sister? Someone with whom you share only one parent. Someone with whom you share only one parent. وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ And أَخَوَات also includes sisters through رَضَعَ Through suckling. What does it mean? That you and another girl were breastfed by the same woman. You and that girl are not related, but you were breastfed by the same woman, therefore you become like sisters. So وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ And your father's sisters, meaning your paternal aunts. عَمَّات is a plural of عَمَّة and Amma is from the root letters Ain Mim Mim. And Amma is used for paternal aunt, meaning father, sister. So who does Ammat include? First of all, real aunts. Real aunts. Who does that include? The sisters of your father and also the sisters of your paternal grandfather. Because remember, Ammat is from your father's side. So you're talking about your father's sister and your Aba also includes who else? Grandfather. So your paternal grandfather's sister. However upwards. Ammat. وَخَالَاتُكُمْ And your mother's sisters. Khalat is a plural of khala. And who is a khala? Maternal aunt. What does that mean? Your mother's sister. And again, khalat includes your real aunts. What does that mean? That the sisters of your mother, sisters of your mother, or who else? The sisters of your grandmother. Which grandmother? Maternal. However, upwards. Wabanatul akh and the daughters of the brothers, meaning your nieces. Banatul akh. Banat is a plural of bint. And Banatul Akh includes the daughters of your brother and it also includes the granddaughters of your brother, however downwards. Real or half. Wa Banatul Akh. Wa Banatul Ukht. And the daughters of the sisters. Meaning, your nieces from your sister. And again, Banatul Ukht includes your sister's daughters as well as your sister's granddaughters, however downwards. Real or half? Full or half? وَأُمَّهَاتُكُمْ And your mothers. Now, up until now, seven types of women were mentioned. And these seven, who are they? Who are they? Muharramat bin Nasab. Meaning those women who are forbidden to you. Why? Because of Nasab. Because of the lineage. Mother, daughter, sister, khala, Amma. Similarly, niece. All of these are what? 
same lineage. Therefore, they are forbidden. Now the second category is of those women who are muharramat through rada'ah. What does that mean? What does rada'ah mean? Suckling, nursing, breastfeeding. So wa ummahatukum and your mothers, allati those who arda'nakum, they suckled you. Arda'na from ra, dad, ain. So those women who have suckled you, they are also like your mothers. So foster mothers, they are also forbidden for you to marry. Even though you are not related otherwise. وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَعَ And also your sisters from رَضَعَ What does it mean by this? أَخَوَات Again is the plural of أُخْت So أَخَوَاتُكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَعَ Who are they? Foster sisters. Who do they include? First of all, the daughters of the wet nurse. The daughters of the wet nurse. And secondly, those women who were nursed by the same wet nurse as you. Those women who were nursed by the same wet nurse as you. وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَعَ Remember that over here, only the foster mothers and foster sisters are mentioned. Through رَضَعَ only the foster mothers and foster sisters are mentioned. However, we learn that all of the other relations, which other the seven categories that were mentioned above. The same applies also through Radar. Right? The same applies also through Radar. So seven through Nasab and also seven through Radar. Then the third category is of Muharramat through Sihr. And what does that mean? Through marriage. Wa ummahat and mothers. Which mothers? Nisa'ikum of your women. Meaning the mothers of your Wives. Who are they? The mothers-in-law. And remember that a mother-in-law is haram forever. Haram forever. What does it mean? That even if her daughter is not married to you anymore, still she is haram for you. وَأُمَّهَاتُ نِسَائِكُمْ وَرَبَائِبُكُمْ And your daughters, which daughters, meaning your Stepdaughters, which ones? Allati fi hujurikum, those who are in your laps. Rabaib is the plural of Rabiba. It is the plural of Rabiba. And Rabiba is from the root letters Rababa and Ribaba or Rab. Who is Rab? One who is a Lord and one who does Tarbiya as well. It is said that Rab and Tarbiya, although Tarbiya is from Raba well, and Rab is from Rababa, they share the same meaning. And Rabaib are the stepdaughters of a man. Who are they? The daughters of your wife. From who? From another husband. And they're called Rabaib. Why? Because usually they're brought up by who? By? By who? By the stepfather. So Rabaibukum your stepdaughters allati those who fi hujurikum in your laps hujur is the plural of hajar or hijr and hijr is lap and this symbolizes guardianship it symbolizes guardianship care so those stepdaughters who are in your care does it mean that if your wife has a daughter who is not in your care you can marry her no allati fi hujurikum this is just descriptive it does not put a condition. It's not conditional, but rather it is just descriptive. So, وَرَبَائِبُكُمْ اللَّاتِ فِي حُجُورِكُمْ So the stepdaughters, meaning the daughters of your wife from previous husband, they are also not allowed for you to marry. Which daughters of your wife? Those wives, اللَّاتِ دَخَلْتُمْ بِهِنَّ Those women whom you entered with. دَخَلْتُمْ is from دَخَلَ and دَخَلْتُمْ بِهِنَّ What does it mean? This is figurative for having sexual relations with them. So in other words, which stepdaughters are forbidden? The daughters of the woman whom you have had sexual relations with. What does this mean? That if a man got married to a woman who has daughters from before, and only the nikah took place, the consummation of marriage did not take place. Let's say the nikah was done over the phone. But after some time, 
it ends up in a divorce. The marriage was never consummated. Now by chance, after a few years, what happens? The man is interested in the daughter of that woman. Is he allowed to marry them? Yes. Why? Because there is a condition of the wife that Allati دَخَلْتُمْ بِهِنَّ Only those wives whom you have entered with. Meaning those wives whom you have consummated the marriage with. So what does it mean? That if the marriage was not consummated, then you are allowed to marry her daughter. Because you never consummated the marriage with the mother. Now I know this is a very rare case. Maybe you've never even heard of it. It's difficult to even imagine this. But law is law. And in law, this is permissible. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُونُوا دَخَلْتُمْ بِهِنَّ Then if you did not enter with them, meaning if you only did nikah with those women, and you did not consummate the marriage, فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ Then there is no sin upon you in marrying who? In marrying the daughter of that woman. فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَحَلَائِلُ أَبْنَائِكُمْ And the wives of your sons. The wives of your sons. They are also forbidden for you to marry. Halail is a plural of halila. It is a plural of halila. And halila, as you know from the root letters, halam lam. What does halal mean? Permissible. So halila is the wife of the son. Who is the halila? The wife of the son. And why is she called halila? Because halal, as you know, it means permissible, but it also means to untie, to open, to descend. So, the wife of the son, where does she live? Where does she descend? Where? The same place as your son lives. Right? So, وَحَلَائِلُ أَبْنَائِكُمْ And the wives of your sons. Who does this refer to? The daughters-in-law. Meaning, a man can also not marry his daughter-in-law. However, we do learn that a man can marry the divorced or widow of an adopted son. The divorced wife or the widow of who? An adopted son. Who is an adopted son? There is no nasab. There is no rada'ah. You've just adopted them. Like we learn in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 4, وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدِعِيَاءَكُمْ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ And he has not made your adopted sons your true sons. They're not like your true sons. So therefore, a man is allowed to marry the divorced woman or the widow of his adopted son. So, وَحَلَائِلُوا أَبْنَائِكُمْ Which abna الَّذِينَ مِنْ أَصْلَابِكُمْ Those who are from your aslab. Aslab is a plural of sulb. Aslab is a plural of sulb. And sulb is used for the backbone, the spinal columns. And basically, aslab it's translated as loin and loin is the pubic region or the organs of reproduction and from this a slab is used figuratively for your biological son figuratively so alladina min aslabikum what does it mean that those sons of yours who are your biological sons who are born from your organs of reproduction meaning they are actually your biological sons your own procreation so your adopted son, his divorced wife, or widow, you can marry. And that you collect, you gather together, you join between who? Ukhtain, two sisters. Meaning this is also forbidden upon you. What? That you have two sisters in marriage together at a time. A man cannot have two sisters as his wives at a time. He can marry one and if by chance there is divorce or the wife dies, then he can marry her sister. But at the same time, jamr, at the same time, that is not permissible. وَأَنْتَجْمَعُوا بَيْنَ الْأُخْتَيْنِ And these ukhtain, these two sisters, could be real sisters, full sisters, they could be half sisters, they can also be sisters through radar. إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Except for that which has already happened. What does it mean? That whatever happened in the past has happened, you're not blameworthy for that. However, if there is a nikah that is with the muharramat, is that going to be valid? No, it is going to be annulled. إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So what do we learn from this ayah? That certain women, they are 
prohibited for a man to marry. Which women are they? They are first of all through nasab, secondly through rada'a, and thirdly through sihr, through marriage. Not all the women, but some of them. And which ones are they? The ones who are mentioned over here. And with regards to rada'a, with regards to suckling, we learn from a hadith that is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim that inna rada'ata tuharrimu ma tuharrimu al-wilada. Suckling prohibits that what birth prohibits. So just as the daughter of your sister is prohibited for you to marry, similarly the daughter of your sister through rada'a is forbidden for you to marry. Just as your own niece is forbidden for you to marry, similarly your niece through rada'a is also forbidden. So seven women through nasab and seven women through rada'a. Seven categories through nasab and seven through rada'a. Now the question is, what is rada'a? What is suckling? Does it mean that just a woman randomly breastfeeds another child just once for like a minute or two and that's it? Rada'a has been established? No. There is a difference of opinion with regards to this. However, the most strongest one seems to be the one of Aisha Dilanha, in which we learn that in Sahih Muslim, it is recorded that Aisha Dilanha, she said that among the parts of the Quran that were revealed before is a statement that 10 incidents of suckling establishes the prohibition concerning marriage. So from it, what do we learn? that there was an ayah that was revealed before that was abrogated later on, meaning in text. And what was that? That ten incidents of suckling. Ten incidents, not just one, but how many? Ten. And this was abrogated later with how many? Five. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, died while this statement was still recited as part of the Qur'an. So basically, initially it was ten, and later on it was five. So from the hadith in Sahih Muslim, what do we learn? How many? Incidents of suckling? Five. And also we must remember that this has to be in the period of suckling. Meaning the child is under the age of two. And he is breastfed at least five times. And he is breastfed to his full. Meaning he has taken a full feeding at least five times. That is what establishes rada. Some say that this can also be established after the age of two. This can also be established after the age of two. Because we learned that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when the command concerning hijab was revealed, there were some families in which there were adopted sons. And these adopted sons, they weren't breastfed. Now all of a sudden, the command of hijab has come. Now just imagine what's going to happen. Just imagine, the woman is living in the same house with her adopted sons. Is she going to be walking around with hijab? Are those children going to be turned out of the house? What's going to happen? It's going to create a big problem. So in that situation, what was done was that those boys, although they were adults, some of the women, they expressed some milk out and they gave the milk to the boys. Why? So that radar could be established. Other scholars say that this cannot be done today because that was only an exceptional case at that time. It was only an exceptional case at that time and the Prophet ﷺ allowed that in that situation. So we cannot apply it today. So what do we learn then? What's a summary? The rada'a is established after how many sucklings? Minimum of five. And when? At which age? Before the age of two. And they have to be full feedings. And also we learn in this ayah that a man cannot have two sisters as his wives at the same time. From the hadith, we also learned that an aunt and a niece also cannot be married at the same time by the same man. An aunt and a niece. So for example, a girl and her khala or a girl and her amma, her maternal aunt or a paternal aunt. Both of them, they cannot be the wives of a man at the same time. Why? Because this leads to, what does it lead to? Problems. Between who? Between the sisters. Between the aunt and the niece. And it could sever relations between the two of them. Because you see, two women who are married to the same man, you know, they can try to get along together, but they can never have a perfect relationship. 
Alright? They can never have a perfect relationship. So if two sisters are together, imagine the fights, imagine the arguments, imagine the animosity they would have for one another. So this would lead to severing relationships. This is why this is not permissible. What else do we learn from this ayah? Basically, the milk of the mother is to be given to the child. Whether it is given directly from the breast or it is expressed and given to the child. It's the same thing. Also we learn that if a man has married a muharrama, a man has married a muharrama, meaning a woman whom he is forbidden to marry. Which women are they? The ones that are mentioned in this ayah. So imagine if a man has married and then he finds out about this. What's going to happen? That marriage is going to be nullified. Which means that he will have to divorce the wife. As we learn from a hadith, in which we learn that Fayroza Daylami, he said that I became a Muslim and I had two sisters at a time in marriage. So I came to the Prophet وسلم, and I informed him. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Talliq ihdahuma. Divorce one of them. Divorce one of them. Understand? So if a man has married a muharrama, whether it is the sister of his wife or it is the mother or it is the aunt or whatever, then what does he have to do? He has to divorce. And if he doesn't, what did we learn? What did we learn? Had has to be implemented. Had has to be implemented. And what was that had? That that man was executed. This is something forbidden. This is something haram. It is sa'asabila. It is maqtan. And the kids, what happens to them? Ma salaf. Again, this is whatever has happened before. They were born out of the tie of marriage. Obviously, it would create a big problem. Obviously, the fuqaha will have to get together and see what can be done. And what if a woman is not sure as to how many times she breastfed the child? She has to take a guess, at least. And she has to consider the minimum that she breastfed. Meaning, if she remembers only one or two occasions, only one or two, then it's not radara. But if she remembers that every other week or every other day, she was also breastfeeding the child. So what does that mean? It's Rodara. Let's listen to the recitation. Ayah number 24, which is in the next juz. Al-Juz al-Khamis. Wal-Muhsanatu min nisa And also prohibited to you are all married women. إِلَّا مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ Except those whom your right hands possess. وَالْمُحْصَنَاتِ This is directly connected with the previous ayah. That حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مُحْصَنَاتِ Also forbidden for you for marriage are who? The muhsanat women. The word muhsanat is the plural of muhsana. And muhsana is from the root letters حَا صَاد نون. What does حِصْن mean? حِصْنُ muslim A fort. Fortress. Fortress of the Muslim, a fort. What does a fort do? It protects the one who is inside. So hasana is to be fortified. And muhsana is one who is in the hisn. One who is mahsun, meaning one who is protected. Who is a muhsana? Who is a muhsana woman? A muhsana woman is first of all a Muslim woman, a believing woman. I'm telling you about the literal meaning of the word. What it means by muhsanat in the context, we'll look at that later. Right now, I want you to understand the meaning of muhsanat, the literal meaning. So first of all, muhsanat includes Muslim women. Why? Because they are protected. They are fortified compared to non-Muslim women. Like for instance, a Muslim woman, she is protected by her hijab, by her father, by her brother, by her husband. As opposed to a non-Muslim woman, she's not protected by her hijab. Secondly, muhsanat includes married women. Who does it include? Married women. Because a married woman is also fortified in the sense that a man cannot come and marry her. She is already married. She is already taken. She is already fortified. So no one can come and have sexual relations with her or get married to her. No, because she is already married. Thirdly, muhsanat applies to afaif, meaning chaste women. Chaste women. Those women who never commit haram don't even think of committing something that is unlawful. 
chaste women. Why are they called muhsanat? Because it is as though they have fortified themselves. They will not go near haram. They will not let any man approach them. They will not expose themselves to situations in which they will be vulnerable. They are chaste women. In the manner that they speak to the men, in the manner that they interact with the other men, they guard their chastity. They are women with hayat. And we learn the afa, if the chaste women, the word muhsanat can be applied to them even if they are not married. Even if they are not married. As we learn in Surah An-Nur, ayah number 4, وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ Those people who accuse the muhsanat, meaning the chaste women, of what? Of committing zina. Also we learn in Surah Al-Tahrim, ayah number 12, وَمَرْيَمَ بِنَتَ عِمْرَانَ الَّتِي أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا And Maryam, alayhi salam, what did she do? She أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا She guarded her private part. So what does it mean? She was chaste. So, muhsanat also applies to afaif, chaste women. Fourthly, the word muhsanat applies to hara'ir, meaning free women. Again, even if they are unmarried. Why? Because they are protected compared to the slave women. They are more protected compared to the slave women. As we learn in the same surah, in ayah number 25, that وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ مِنْكُمْ طَوْلًا أَنْ يَنْكِحَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ over there, muhsanat refers to free women. So who are the muhsanat? First of all, Muslim. Secondly, married. Thirdly, chaste. Fourthly, free. Over here in the context, who are the muhsanat? Married. That the married women are also forbidden for you to marry. Obviously, chaste women are not forbidden. They are recommended. Okay? So muhsanat, who does it refer to? Those women who are married. So a man cannot marry a woman who is already married to someone. To such an extent that he cannot even propose her. He cannot even propose her while she's married. He cannot even propose her while she is in the idda. Remember? If she's in the idda even, a proposal cannot be sent to her. Min nisa from the women. Illa except ma malakat aymanukum. Except for that which your right hands possess. What does it mean by this? Ma malakat aymanukum. Ma malakat aymanukum, as you know, refers to slaves. And over here in particular, slave women. Illa is an exception from who? Muhsanat. Who are the muhsanat? Married women. So except for those married women who become slaves. And once they become slaves, what happens? Their nikah is invalidated. It does not remain valid anymore. The captive women, the enslaved women, what happens immediately? Their nikah with their husbands is invalidated. We see that amongst the Arabs, obviously they would have many, many battles all the time. And if they were victorious upon a tribe or upon their enemy, what would happen? They would take captives. Which captives? Who were taken as captives? Those people who were either in the battlefield or, for example, if an army raided another town or city or a tribe, then whoever they could catch over there, they would take them as captives. Now, these captives included men, women, and children. It included men, women, and children. Now, when Islam came, all types of warfare were forbidden. For instance, you couldn't just go attack somebody just because you had a fight with them. You couldn't go attack somebody just because your grandfather had a fight with them. No. All of these fights and battles were forbidden. They were completely forbidden. And the only reason that was left was for what? For the sake of Islam, meaning for the sake of defense. Like for instance, the Muslims, they had a battle with the people of Mecca. When? At the Battle of Badr, at the Battle of Uhud, and so many other battles. Now, when the women were captured, along with the other captives, now a soldier could not just randomly go pick on any woman and have sexual relations with her. No, this was forbidden. What would be done is that all of the captives, they would be brought together in one place. Just as the booty that was collected was brought together in one place. As we learned, that even the leader, even the Prophet wasallam was not allowed to take anything from the booty for himself in the sense that from hiding from the rest of the people. 
everything was to be collected in one place and from there it was distributed amongst the people. So the captives even, they were brought together in one place and then it was up to the government as to what they decided to do. Now either those captives were exchanged with the enemy for a portion of the land that was seized. Okay? Like for instance, just imagine that the Muslims they had a battle with the people of Mecca. Now, from the people of Mecca, they got some captives. Now, there's many things that you can do with the captives. First of all, send those captives back in exchange for some benefit. In exchange for some benefit. We will release your prisoners if you do such and such. If you give us this benefit. Now, that benefit could be that you free our land. You give our land back to us. The land of ours that you've conquered, give it back to us. Or give back our prisoners. Because obviously the enemy also has your prisoners. So the captives, either they would be exchanged for prisoners or for some other benefits. Or sometimes these captives were distributed amongst the people as slaves. These captives were distributed amongst the people as slaves. Now you may ask, why? Think about it. If these captives are left in the battlefield, what are they going to do? They're going to harm you. If they're sent back home, what are they going to do? They've seen what you have. They're going to come back and attack you. And if you set them free in your city, what's going to happen? They don't have any family. They don't have any relatives. And there could be a lot of corruption. Women without mahram is spending the night out on the street. What's going to happen? She's vulnerable. There's going to be fitna. There's going to be a lot of facade. Men are hungry. They have nothing with themselves. They want to eat. What are they going to do? theft maybe so instead of you know these people being left on their own to wander and fend for themselves what was done was they were distributed amongst the people as slaves and slaves as we know in Islam also have rights that we're not going to discuss right now because that is not the objective over here the focus is the slave women now what happened with a woman who was a war captive and was given to someone as a slave. What happened with her? The moment that she was captured, the moment that she was captured, her nikah with her husband, her marriage with her husband, even though she's a mushrik, even though she's a non-Muslim, is what? It is invalidated. And remember that never can you capture a Muslim woman. Never can you capture Muslims and take them as captives. That is completely forbidden. That cannot be done. So if Muslims have a fight with other Muslims, they cannot take captives from one another. That is something that cannot even be think of. That cannot even be imagined. So the marriage that that slave woman, that that captive woman had with her husband, that is immediately invalidated. And she is kept as a slave by her master, in which what happens is, that she has to obey the master in the sense that whatever he tells her to do, she has to do. And similarly, the master also has a right to have sexual relations with her. But remember that it is only the master who can have sexual relations with her. That woman cannot be treated as a prostitute. That the master is enjoying her. His son and his brother, all of them are enjoying her. No. She is only for the master. She cannot be treated like a prostitute. And remember, if she is left on her own, she is not made a slave, a captive woman, what's going to happen? We discussed that. Prostitution, so many wrong things could happen. So if she is kept in a house, if she's given a family, this is for her betterment, this is for her protection. And if she is living in somebody's house, working for someone, working as a slave, now a man is looking at a woman all the time. Just imagine she's very attractive. Imagine she's young. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Either zina or rape. It's going to happen. So what has been done is that the woman who is a slave woman, the master is allowed to have sexual relations with her, but he cannot treat her like a prostitute. And she also has rights. She also has rights. And we see that if a man has children with the slave woman, Because the question is that now, if they have children together, what's going to happen with those children? Now those children were either considered as slaves, or 
they were considered, they were recognized and liberated by the father. So basically it was up to the father as to what he wanted to do. Either he could keep them as slaves or he could consider them as his own children and treat them as his own children. It's up to him. It's his choice. And we see that in our deen there were many incentives of freeing slaves. So first of all, enslaving people, that was also limited. Before, randomly you could go raid a people and capture their people and make them slaves. But now this was not allowed. Only in the case of defense of Islam, only in the case of protection of Islam, only then could you fight a people and take their people as captives. And even after taking people as captives, there is so much encouragement in our deen to free slaves. We learn that for so many sins, the kafala, the expiation of sin is what? That you free a slave. And there's so much reward for a person who frees the slave woman and who marries her and keeps her as his wife. And as we will learn in the following ayat, that a man is encouraged even to marry a slave woman. That if you cannot afford to marry a free woman, go marry a slave woman. Free her and marry her. Just imagine. We think that, oh my God, slavery is allowed in Islam. You see, this concept of slavery, it exists. And it definitely existed in the past. Especially in the culture in which the Prophet ﷺ came in. So, what did our deen do? It fixed the problem. It fixed the situation. Even today you see, battles take place and prisoners of wars are there. What happens with these prisoners? What happens with them? Either they are kept in jail cells and they're raped day in and day out, especially women. And the men, even they're sexually harassed day in and day out. Isn't it so? And they're tortured, physically abused, and sometimes a very high price is set for their freedom. And sometimes they're kept in confinement for no crime. So we see that in our deen, even the prisoners of war, you cannot just keep them in jail cells. Decide. Either you're sending them back for a benefit in return, or you're keeping them as slaves. Because it's better to be a slave than be a prisoner in a cell and being sexually harassed. Because a slave still has rights. A slave can say something, can do something, but a person who is in prison, what can he do? What can he say? Nothing. So over here we see that the muhsanat, they are forbidden for you to marry, except for those muhsanat who have been captured and enslaved. Okay? Except for those muhsanat who are captured and enslaved. Because as soon as a woman is enslaved, what happens? Her marriage is invalidated. Allah says, Kitab Allahi alaykum. This is a decree of Allah upon you. Meaning this command, this injunction is a decree. Meaning you have no freedom with regards to this. You have to follow the command of Allah. وَأُحِلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكُمْ And allowed for you, permissible for you are who? مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكُمْ Whatever is beyond that. Meaning all the other women, all of the other women, except for these muharramat, you are allowed to marry them. These women you're not allowed to marry, go marry anybody else. As long as you fulfill the conditions of marriage. And what are they? That antabtagu, that you seek bi amwalikum with your wealth. First condition is that tabtagu bi amwalikum, that you seek the spouse, you seek the wife, how? Through your wealth. What does it mean by that? That a man must spend his wealth on the woman at the time of marriage. What does that mean? That he has to give the mahar to the woman. A man must give the mahar to the woman. And tabtagu bi amwalikum. First condition. Secondly, muhsinina. Ones being chased. Over here it says ones meaning women being chased. It's not women. Muhsin is masculine. It's actually the men. Meaning the men, when they marry the women, they should marry the women while being chased. What does it mean? That the man must seek her as a muhsin. That he should bring the woman in wedlock. He should bring the woman in wedlock. He should not just have sexual relations with her. And this concept of prostitution is what? That you give the money and you enjoy the woman sexually. And also this nikah muta or nikah misyar, what is it? In which a man just, it is as though he gives the rent to the woman for having enjoyed her sexually. 
This is something incorrect. It goes against this command of Allah. What is the first condition? And tabtahu bi amwalikun. Secondly, muhsinin, that your intention of getting together with them is to keep them in wedlock, not just to enjoy them for a day or a night or a week and then divorce them. No, muhsinin. غَيْرَ مُسَافِحِينَ Not مُسَافِحِينَ مُسَافِحِينَ is the plural of مُسَافِح And مُسَافِح is from the root letter سِينَ فَاحَ And what is سِفَاح? Zina Illegal sexual intercourse And literally سَفَحَ is to flow water To shed water To pour forth some liquid And غَيْرَ مُسَافِحِينَ What does it mean? That you don't get together with them Just to flow some liquid Meaning just to flow some Semen. In the sense that the purpose of getting together is not just to indulge in sexual pleasure. It is not just to satisfy sexual pleasure. But the purpose of marriage is, the purpose of marriage is, muhsinin, having a family, being in a wedlock, having a family together. So first of all, what's the condition? An tabdahu bi amwalikun. Secondly, muhsinin. Thirdly, غير مسافحين And غير مسافحين is also understood as مسافحين meaning زانين Meaning don't join with them just to commit zina Just to legalize zina That okay, let's do nikah for just a week Let's do nikah for just a day No, this is something that is incorrect فَمَا اسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ Then whatever that you benefited Be he with it Meaning through the nikah Whatever that you have benefited minhunna from them فَآتُوهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ Then you must give them their mahr. Then you must give them their ajr. What does it mean by this? That once the man consummates the marriage with the woman, then the mahr becomes obligatory. He has to give it. Until he consummates the marriage, until he consummates the marriage, you can say that obviously mahr is part of marriage, it is a condition of marriage. However, if, if a man delays or he doesn't fix it, he's not obligated. But once the marriage has been consummated, once istimta has been done, meaning a man has sexually enjoyed her, then fa'atu unna ujurahunna, then he must give the mahar to the woman. This is what? This is a fadila. It is an obligation. From who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you notice, so many times the mahar has been mentioned in this surah. And unfortunately, this is ignored so much by our Muslims. وَلَا جِنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ And there is no blame upon you. فِيمَا تَرَاضَيْتُمْ بِهِ In what you mutually agree with. مِنْ بَعْدِ الفريضة, After the fariḍah. What does it mean by this? That after you give the mahar to the woman, after you give the mahar to the woman, later on, there is no sin on you if the woman decides to give up part of her mahar. You understand? وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِيمَا تَرَاضَيْتُمْ What is تَرَاضَيْتُمْ? That both of you mutually agree. Both of you agree. So the woman is not forced to give up the mahar, but rather she agrees. And you also agree that she gives back the mahar to you. Either part of or some of. Because we learn so much about the importance of giving the mahar completely and totally to the woman. It's her right. It's her property. What do we learn here? That if after the consummation of marriage, after the man has given the mahar to the woman, Later on if the woman says, you gave this money to me, I don't need it, I see that you need it, take it. Mutual agreement. Is there a sin on the man if he takes it? No. There is no sin. This also teaches us that if, you know, somebody has given a gift to you, and later on, if by mutual agreement you want to give that thing to them, because they need it, out of mutual agreement, then it's okay. But otherwise to demand a gift back, to take a gift back, that is something that is forbidden. But if it's taradaitam, if it is with mutual agreement, then it is permissible. Secondly, it has been said that wala jana haalaykum fima taradaitam bihi min baad al farida. What this means is that when you got married, and what was the condition of marriage? That you give the mahar, that you do it with the intention of ihsan, and that you do it ghayra musafihin. So afterwards, if you do end up divorcing the wife if you do end up divorcing the wife then there is no blame there is no blame because the condition was that when you get married to her you should bring her into wedlock 
Yes, you have brought her into wedlock. Now after a few months, you see that there are clear differences and you cannot get along together. And you think that it's better for you to separate from one another. So there is no blame. فِيمَا تَرَضَيْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْفَرِيضَ After the obligation. Which obligation? The obligation of mahr. إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Indeed, Allah is knowing and He is also wise. Notice, عَلِيمًا and حَكِيمًا These two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have appeared so many times already in this surah. Why? To show us what? That all of these laws that are being given to you, whether they are with regards to the rights of the orphan, the rights of the women, with regards to marriage, whatever they are, they are based on what? What are they based on? The knowledge of Allah and the wisdom of Allah. Allah knows about His creation. He has created them. He knows what is best for them. And it's based on His wisdom. It's based on His wisdom. He knows what is best for them. He knows what is good for them. And therefore, He has given these commands. Let's listen to the recitation. وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلْحِينَ This muhsineen, who does it refer to? The men. That when they get married, they should become chaste as well. Muhsanat, yes, it's used for women. Free women, married women, chaste women. But once the men are married, they should also live a chaste life. Because many times chastity is expected of women. But the man, he can go and do whatever he wants. He has a wife, but he can also go and indulge in womanizing. But muhsin is a man who is chaste, who fortifies his chastity. How? By being in wedlock. And once he has married a woman, then he is not going to go sleep with other women. And once he has married a woman, she is not going to go sleep with other men. This is forbidden. Even if they have a mutual agreement. Because sometimes people do have a mutual agreement. It's okay, I don't care. No. This is something forbidden. The men also have to be muhsineen. It's not just the women. Both are required to be muhsineen. Let's listen to the recitation of these verses from the beginning. <laughs> 